Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's program. Welcome to Salem State's 2021 Recognition and Celebration of Charlotte Fortin. Charlotte graduated from Salem Normal School in 1856 and demonstrated her talents as an abolitionist, writer, poet, educator, translator, and women's rights activist throughout her professional life. As an activist for both the abolition of slavery and women's rights, we intentionally celebrate Charlotte at the intersection of Black History and Women's History Month. I want to express my gratitude for the hard work and planning of the Charlotte Fortin Working Group. COVID-19 has made it challenging for many members of the committee to meet. However, every member found a way to assure that we would have a 2021 event. Thank you. I should also thank History Alive for helping us with the performances that are part of today's event. We opened with a performance of I Am an Abolitionist, and we will conclude with a very special performance from Samantha Searles as Charlotte Fortin. Samantha's performance will follow today's presentation by Professor Joanne Pope Mellish. We had hoped to have Professor Mellish a year ago, and I'm excited that she's ridden out COVID-19 with us at the Charlotte Fortin Working Group. I look forward to Dr. Mellish's presentation and the questions you will share. At this time, I invite President John Keenan to provide a welcome and remarks. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm thrilled to join you on this windy, wintry day, winter day in recognition of Charlotte Fortin. 
Today's event would not be possible without the efforts of the Charlotte Fortin Working Group. And I must say, I miss seeing you in our office, in my office here to, to discuss and organize for this event, but I'm thrilled that we're able to pull it off again this year. Thank you to each and all for putting this program together. Charlotte Fortin Day provides us with an important reminder of the persistence that is required to address inequities that have been endured by black and brown communities in the United States. We must not forget the important social justice commitment that remains as we work to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. In recent decades, we have redoubled our efforts to make Salem State an institution of choice for black and brown students from across the Commonwealth. We remain committed to making sure we serve these students well. Commitments to the early college program, to helping students find affordable paths to degree completion and the Department of Higher Education's equity agenda are just a few examples of our efforts to improve access and more importantly, success. Last week, we announced that we plan to launch the Viking Success Collaborative to remove barriers that have historically stood in the way of student success. Dr. Bennett will lead those efforts. Our equity goals are shared across campus and indeed across this Commonwealth, as Commissioner Santiago has rightly made equity higher education's top priority. Countless members of our faculty and staff have dedicated their careers and scholarship to addressing conditions that impede success of black and brown communities. Our recognition of Charlotte Fortin honors the ongoing commitment of our faculty, students and staff to carrying on her legacy. In the spirit of connecting the past and the future, it is my great pleasure to introduce Toyelle Washington. Toyelle is a senior in the Department of Sociology and will be introducing today's presenter. Toyelle is the 2021 recipient of Salem State's Martin Luther King Jr. Undergraduate Leadership Award and is a leader in Salem's Black, Brown and Proud organization. Toyelle is also the co-founder and executive director of Black Boston, an organization that has endeavored to uplift and support Black Bostonians in respond, response to the systemic inequities illuminated by the murder of George Floyd. Toyelle's commitment to being a successful student leader and activist mirrors the spirit demonstrated by Charlotte Fortin. Thank you, Toyelle, for your outstanding efforts and contributions. We look forward to your remarks. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, um, President Canyon, for the kind words. Uh, if it's okay with you all, I'd like to just share a small thought um, that I've been having lately. Um, and so I once read that the black sheep in the family turns into the goat. And for those who don't know, in my generation, the goat has been used as a term of endearment. And it's an abbreviation that stands for greatest of all time. And when I read that quote, um, I initially just thought about who the evolved black sheep is. And to me, I feel like that's black women. I'm blessed to live in a generation where we get to celebrate the accomplishments a black woman like Charlotte Fortin. And with that being said, I wanna introduce you all to another GOAT. Um, so Dr. Mellish is an associate professor of a 19th century US history at the University of Kentucky. Her field of interest includes the history of racial production in the United States, slavery and emancipation, 19th century American culture and social history and 19th century African-American history. She's an author of Disowning Slavery, Gradual Emancipation, and Race in New England. She has received several awards, among them a National Endowment for Humanities Fellowship, and has reviewed numerous books by her colleagues in her field. Professor Mellish is actively involved in public history and education and to that end has served as a consultant historian to the Brown University Steering Committee on Slavery and Justice and to the Rhode Island Council for Humanities. Welcome Professor Mellish. We look forward to hearing your discussion on race in the free American North in the 19th century. Thank you very much, Toyelle. Uh, first, I, I wanna thank Salem State University and the Charlotte Fortin Working Group for inviting me to talk today. My subject 
is race in New England as Charlotte Fortin would have encountered it. First as a young girl when she came to school in Salem in 1853, and later at the end of the Civil War when she served as secretary of the Boston branch of the Freedmen's Union Commission, recruiting and training teachers to teach newly freed and slave people in the South. First, I will talk about how New England became a racialized landscape, how it was shaped by slavery and emancipation to become the place Charlotte encountered in 1853, and how it changed during the Civil War years to become the place she encountered again later. Charlotte wrote about Salem in her journal as a young girl and published at least two pieces of writing specifically describing New England. One was an article written in Salem when she was 21, describing the environment and the people of the town. And a second piece more generally about New England, but more sharply focused on race and New England as an environment for people of color that she wrote in her early 50s when she was living in Washington, DC, but was still in touch with friends in New England. I will explore what these three pieces of writing tell us about Charlotte's experiences of and ideas about race in New England. And then I will conclude by making a couple of suggestions about how the racial landscape of Charlotte's New England compares maybe with ours today. So first, let me begin talking a little bit about the world that Charlotte was accustomed to before she came to New England, the Philadelphia of the 1830s and 40s. As, as most of you probably know, Charlotte Fortin was born in Philadelphia in 1837 to the son and daughter-in-law of James Fortin. Wait a minute. Sorry. I got all excited about um, I'm sorry, I am attempting to go to slideshow, which is hidden under the mute um, stuff at the top here. Um, well, oh, here we go. Okay. There is my topic, race. At, uh, in the free American North. Um, this is James Fortin. She was born in Philadelphia to the son and daughter-in-law of James Fortin. Here is James Fortin, a, a wealthy and successful businessman and prominent abolitionist. Pennsylvania had begun a program of gradual emancipation of enslaved people in 1780 and an increasing number of free people of color had moved to Philadelphia in the years that followed that passage of that statute, along with fugitives who came in from the slave state of Maryland, which was just over the border. The visible freedom of a growing black population sparked white hostility. By the early 1820s, individual people of color, including one of Charlotte's uncles, began to be assaulted in the streets. Angry white mobs attacked the Fortin's neighborhood and other predominantly black neighborhoods repeatedly. 1824, 1825, 29, 32, 34, 35, all of these were major mob, white mob attacks. A couple of months before Charlotte's birth, another white mob attacked a house in the Fortin neighborhood. And when she was a baby, yet another mob ransacked and set fire to the newly opened Philadelphia Hall. That's a picture of the fire, white mob burning. Because it was hosting a women's anti-slavery convention that included black and white speakers together and therefore was rumored to be inciting amalgamation, that is to say interracial relationships, interracial marriage. When Charlotte was five years old, the same year that her beloved grandfather, James Fortin died, yet another white mob attacked black churches and black homes and laid siege to the home of one of her aunts, Harriet Fortin and her husband, Robert Purvis. 
sporadic acts of violence targeting African Americans continued throughout Charlotte's youth. While James Fortin had successfully spearheaded a movement to persuade Philadelphia to provide publicly funded education for black children in 1822, those schools remained rigidly segregated. By the time Robert Fortin, Charlotte's father, decided to send his daughter to New England in 1853 to finish her education in an integrated school, she was 16, we can assume that she was more than ready to put white hostility behind her and probably anticipated a very different kind of experience from this Philadelphia experience that I'm talking about when she got to New England. What did she find in 1853 in New England? In the colonial period, there had been many enslaved laborers in New England, some 15,000 on the eve of the American Revolution. And of course, New England had been the center of the American slave trade. Um, this, show, this is a comparative slide showing the numbers of um, enslaved people who become, um, they're still enslaved, but some, a growing population of them become free by 1790, by the first federal census. But you can see, for example, in Massachusetts, there had been 5,000 enslaved people on the eve of the revolution, a little more than 5,000. Um, the region had gone through after, after the 1780s, its own experience of the emancipation of enslaved people, late 1700s, early 1800s. This was an experience, however, that was clouded by uncertainty in Massachusetts and laden with what can only be called deceit elsewhere. Freedom suits, this is uh, the, the actual, uh, one of the lawyers uh, or the judge's notes is, is the, the background of this, um, the, the writing here. Freedom suits in Massachusetts had led to court decisions in 1781 and 1783 that were believed by some, but not by others, very ambiguous to have made slavery illegal in Massachusetts by 1783. But Massachusetts towns continued to tax enslaved people as property through 1786. Here's an example of the Deerfield, um, uh, Massachusetts um, tax listing. And you see um, eight servants at, at um, three pounds for 24 pounds. They're being taxed. That's their um, the valuation properties, 1784 and 85 after supposedly slavery had ended. Slaves were bought and sold in Massachusetts, at least through 1787. Massachusetts listed no enslaved people in the first federal census in 1790, and you hear about how, how there are no slaves there, but that also is questionable. According to one historian of the period, the Massachusetts census, census taker, who was himself opposed to slavery, discouraged people from listing the slaves they actually had. Elsewhere, what about elsewhere in New England? Gradual, gradual statutes offered prospective freedom to children born to enslaved women, freedom at their majority many years after their birth, after they'd worked for their owners or claimers. Slavery did not actually become illegal, end, until the 1840s in Rhode Island and Connecticut and 1857 in New Hampshire, 1857, the eve of the Civil War. In Vermont, where slavery supposedly became illegal with the passage of the 1777 state constitution, enslaved people were bought, sold, and listed in the Vermont census as slaves through 1810. So this is a deceitful kind of process, but slowly free people of color are emerging as a population. And in New England, as in Philadelphia, black freedom resulted in white hostility expressed in a host of ways. Here is a characterization of the black population published in the Providence Beacon in 1824. Notice naturally vicious and wicked, no character, utter indifference how they live, idleness, intemperance, an appeal, appalling spectacle of profligate and abandoned population. This was very common language being used by the growing population of free people of color. 
there had been a mob attack against Boston's black community in 1828. Um, this is a broadside, a poster, a kind of poster created by whites to make fun of the people being attacked and the attack. Wait a minute. There had been two attacks on black neighborhoods in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, 1824, 1831, another one in Hartford in 1843. This is New England. The Connecticut legislature had passed a black law in 1833 banning any school from accepting blacks outside, from outside the state after a Quaker woman named Prudence Crandall had admit, admitted a black girl from out of state to her girl's school in Canter Canterbury, Connecticut. And as um, the townspeople were enraged and then she invited more black girls to come because all the white girls parents pulled them out. And so as a further inducement to Prudence Crandall to cease and desist, Down. Down. the townspeople poisoned the school's well. In 1835, when Noyes Academy opened in Canaan, New Hampshire as an integrated school, 500 white men with 100 oxen Imagine that, dragged the school off its foundation and three years later, another mob burned it to the ground. That's the history of the gradual emancipation of slaves in New England. So by 1853, when Charlotte arrived in Salem, much of the overt violence against people of color had subsided, but tensions remained. There were many reasons for that. The shipbuilding and maritime commerce um, that had been the engine of growth and prosperity in Salem, as in much of New England, had subsided. And what had taken its place was the rise of the textile industry, an industry dependent on Southern cotton grown and picked by enslaved African descended people. Three million of them in the early 1850s, four million by the Civil War. In Salem, there was Nam Keg. Steam Cotton Company, founded in 1839, and Pequot Mills, operated by Nam Keg after 1847. Other businesses ancillary to the textile industry um, were, the, were the new engine of prosperity at Salem. Cotton processing, and also the manufacture and sale of what was called Negro cloth, a, a woolen cloth that was sent to the South, as well as shoes, hats, and metal, tool, metal tools sold to Southern markets for the use of enslaved people tied Massachusetts tightly to the slave societies of the South. And as an example of how tightly, here's the fact that the $5 bill issued in 1862, we're talking during the civil, beginning of Civil War, by the Conway Bank, Conway, Massachusetts, some of you, a little tiny town in the foothills of the Berkshires. It's got maybe 2,000 people in it now. Notice featured on this Conway Bank note on its face the image of an enslaved boy in a straw hat holding a basket of raw cotton. Conway. At the same time, however, an active anti slavery movement had also taken root in Massachusetts in the 1830s, a movement in which Black men and women were prominent from the outset. When Charlotte came to Salem, she stayed with the family of one of the most prominent Black abolitionists, Charles Lennox Remond, an agent of the Massachusetts Anti Slavery Society. His sister, Sarah Parker Remond, was also a prominent anti slavery lecturer. But the anti-slavery movement, with its elevation of Black leadership and the calls of many of its spokespeople, not, but not all, of any, for Black equality, generated renewed racial hostility. Where broadsides, these crude, crude I showed you one before, wall posters had ridiculed Black people in the 20s and 30s, now minstrel shows lampooned them in the 40s and 50s coincident with, with the, the same time Charlotte is arriving in New England. Some of the hostility toward Blacks was aroused by the increasing visibility of a growing middle and professional class of African-Americans, educated, well-off, such as the Remons and the Nells, William Cooper Nell, 
and the Putnam families in Salem. Often as well off as many white elites, they were not welcome in elite white neighborhoods. These were the genteel African-Americans whose very existence enraged many whites in New England and elsewhere in, elsewhere in the, the mid 19th century. Uh, white people uh, were disgusted by poor black people. They were enraged by successful well-to-do black people. So both slavery and race were divisive issues in Massachusetts and throughout New England in the 1850s. How did the young Charlotte Fortin, fresh from Philadelphia, encounter these issues in Massachusetts? Charlotte kept a journal throughout her years as a schoolgirl in Salem. In it, she extols the anti-slavery activism going on in the state, but she is also candid and discouraged about the widespread resistance to it. In June of 1854, she reports in her journal on the capture, trial, and ultimate return to enslavement in Virginia of fugitive Anthony Burns. She says, quote, so many groaning, hissing lines of people, she's talking about anti-slavery supporters, amassed to protest as he was marched to a southbound boat that federal troops, state militiamen, and the entire Boston police force were on hand to prevent any attempts at rescue. Today, Massachusetts has again been disgraced, she says. Again, Massachusetts has showed her submission to the slave power. Charlotte is also candid about the mixed responses she and her African-American friends received in overwhelmingly white Salem. In September of 1854, she reports that her friends, the Putnams, had been refused admission to a museum, quote, after having tickets given to them solely on account of their complexion. Insulting language was used to them. Of course, they felt and exhibited deep, bitter indignation, but of what avail was it? None, but to excite the ridicule of those contemptible, contemptible creatures, miserable doe faces who do not deserve the name of men. A year later, now at Salem Normal School, she notes that Quote, it is pleasant to meet the scholars again. Most of them greet me cordially, but quote, the thought will intrude of the want of entire sympathy, even of those I know and like best. She goes on, there is one young girl and only one Miss B who I believe has no prejudice against color. She describes quote, girls in the schoolroom who've been thoroughly kind and cordial to me. Perhaps the next day when I meet them in the street, they fear to recognize me. Others give the most distant recognitions possible. I acknowledge no such recognitions and they soon cease entirely. These apparent trifles are most wearing and discouraging. They reveal volumes of deceit and heartlessness and early teach a lesson of suspicion and mistrust. It is hard to go through, still Scarlet, uh, Charlotte, it is hard to go through life fearing with good reason to love and trust hardly anyone whose skin is white, however lovable, attractive, and congenial in seeming. She's having a mixed experience, needless to say. In June of 1858, when Charlotte was 21 and had returned to Philadelphia briefly for her health, she wrote an article called Glimpses of New England, recalling her time in Massachusetts that was published in the National Anti-Slavery Standard. Most of the essay is about Salem, which she identifies as S period. That's a common thing in the 19th century, S. And most of that, most of the essay recalls landscape, houses, trees, gardens. Nearly all of this description is warmly nostalgic. But in the middle of the essay, she touches briefly on the people of Salem. Here she heaps extensive praise on her teachers, quote, warm, true, loving hearts and the female anti-slavery society, quote, noble-hearted women who faithfully persevere in their labors for the slave. But she says that those beloved few are surrounded by an environment characterized by, quote, many opposing and chilling influences. She says that S, Salem, is a very aristocratic town and most of its inhabitants have but little sympathy with reforms of any kind to their shame. She relates an anecdote about the rage of Salem's leading white citizens at, this, 
uh, their rage at the Salem Lyceum for inviting two abolitionists to give talks there. After telling, repeating this, relating this story, she returns to extolling the beauty of the landscape. Charlotte's most extensive piece on race in New England was her response to a September 1889 editorial in a New York Presbyterian journal called The Evangelist. The editorial was entitled, quote, relations of whites and blacks in the South as compared with the North, is there a color line in New England? The editor and proprietor of the journal, a white clergyman named Henry Martin Field, had been raised and educated in Massachusetts and had spent some time as pastor of a church in West Springfield. So although he was residing in New York, editing his journal there in 1889, he apparently felt that he was an authority on race in New England. This was a big mistake. I have been unable to locate this particular issue of the evangelist that printed uh, Field's editorial. Various issues of it are scattered across a number of archives. But from Charlotte's response, we can see that it was an, that Field's piece was an indictment of Northern Blacks. According to Charlotte, Field had said that after after a hundred years of freedom during which the black man has had every right that belongs to his white neighbor, blacks had made no progress. They were still field workers and washerwomen and chimney sweeps, never merchants, bankers, lawyers, legislators, etc. He had gone on as slaves. They had had no Moses to lead them out of bondage. They had shown no leadership capacity in the civil war either. And yet they wanted social equality. Apparently, Field had concluded his editorial with an offer to be corrected if he was wrong. Charlotte took him up on that. First, she noted that slavery had not ended a century before in New England. Remember, it had not become illegal everywhere in New England until the eve of the Civil War. Then she recited a litany of incidents of injustice, persecution, segregation, and violence that had been the day-to-day -day experience of Northern people of color once they had finally become free. A litany quite similar to the one I gave you at the beginning of my talk. So much for, quote, having every right that belonged to the white neighbor. She countered the no progress argument with a long and detailed list of educated black lawyers and ministers. Here, uh, her, this is Francis Grimke on the left, her husband, He's a Presbyterian minister who was a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary. Uh, his brother Archibald was on the right there, had been a, an, was an attorney. She listed various doctors, dentists, merchants, judges, and teachers. Here is a group, um, group portrait of many just such well-educated, forward-thinking uh, African-American men and women this is a picture of them a few years later associated with the Niagara movement, forefront of a forerunner of the NAACP. You see in the very front, the man to the left is W.E.B. Du Bois. And she listed several of the 13, 13 black men who had served or were serving in the Massachusetts House of Representatives between 1866 and, 1860, and 1896 in over 30 years, two of whom she knew personally um, she knew George Lewis Ruffin and Lewis Hayden. Finally, she argued that enslaved people had indeed had leadership, citing Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett, and Samuel Ward, Samuel Ringgold Ward, and had also demonstrated leadership as Union Army officers in the highest ranks in which they were permitted to serve. There were barriers to their promotion. They were not at the top because they were not allowed to get there. She concluded by dismissing the social equality argument as irrelevant. What people of color wanted was equal rights as American citizens and to be treated with a Christian spirit by professed Christians. From these three pieces of Charlotte Fortin's writing about New England and race that spanned some 35 years and considering the prologue to that time period, the slow and reluctant abandonment of slavery in New England, the growth of a population of free people of color and the response of whites to both those things, we can draw some conclusions that have surprising, maybe not so surprising, 
resonance in Northern life today. First, from the days of the first emancipation, earliest emancipation, many whites seem to view freedom as a kind of test that they believed blacks were destined to fail. And these whites seem to do their best to force them to fail and then spent more than a hundred years complaining that they were failing, that they were inferior, making no progress, were suspect in various ways, were dangerous, needed control. Resonates, yes? People of color persevered in these times and increasing numbers like Charlotte's family did succeed and continue to succeed today against persistent barriers. From the early 1800s, white leaders made every effort to manage and limit, limit free people of color in a host of ways, restricting where they could go, where they could go to school, and where they could live. These barriers, too, resonate. This is a map showing redlining in Boston in the 1930s, 1930s identifying areas where people of color would not be allowed to obtain mortgages. From the 19th century on, well-to-do whites have also attempted to limit people of color as renters to specific areas of the oldest, most rundown housing. When preservationists beginning in the 1940s and 50s decided to restore and renew those areas, black renters were forced out. Gentrification and urban renewal have sometimes been called Negro removal. All of these issues generated in the interests of white supremacy intersecting with maintaining class privilege have been most visible and acute in large Northern cities. But Charlotte tells us that although she loved her school and she loved her teachers, Salem in the 19th century was not immune to some of these issues, and one might say that a few of them survive to this day. Thank you. Um, how do I make it go away? I think if you stop screen sharing, ah, um, it'll be both of us. Thank you so much for your presentation today. At this time, I'd like to invite our audience today, which is in the neighborhood of around 70 participants, to provide us with questions that can fuel a bit of a discussion after uh, the presentation today. Um, I'll be partnering with uh, my colleague, Mandy Ray, in handling those questions as they come in. Um, but I also um, in beginning, extended an opportunity, the offer to um, our student um, who introduced you today to ask the first question. Um, I'm happy um, to invite Toyo back in at this point if she has a, a question after hearing today's presentation or maybe something that is on her mind prior to today's presentation that uh, she'd like to ask. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, and so um, my first question for you, Dr. Mellish, is as a scholar of Charlotte Fortin, do you have some thoughts on her optimism for racial equity and inclusion specifically while she was still in the South? Well, I think that, um, again, you know, Char Charlotte Fortin per se is not my specialty. My specialty is generally uh, race, slavery, emancipation, um, uh, North and South, um, and, and the development of communities of free people of color. But as far as her optimism, I think, I think the end of the Civil War and the Reconstruction period um, were optimistic periods for Black people North and South. I think one of the, the stellar characteristics of people of color um, always has been um, the idea that each, each new moment, the black people in the, during the revolution thought, aha, the revolution, it says all men are created equal. Now we're going to be equal. And that didn't happen. The civil war was ended slavery. And, and, and I almost 
almost all people of color thought, now we will have an opportunity. And briefly, of course, there were, there were um, uh, black men elected to, to Congress and there, it was a, a blossoming moment. Um, I think it was a, has been a continual surprise and again today is a surprise over again, how resistant the, the, the tight holding on to white supremacy is in this country. I, I think, um, I mean, there was so much violence against black people in, this, in the, the, the reconstruction period in the South. Um, and I'm sure that was disheartening, but I think Charlotte, Believed, believed in the future. I think the alternative is, um, is destructive to the soul. I think um, most black people in her time believed in the future. Um, I guess that would be my, my answer. Thank you. Um, if you don't mind, um, when we met in preparation for this presentation. I told you a little story and I appreciated your thoughts so much that I'd like to um, tell that story again because I thought your response was, was very insightful. So I share that when we met that I arrived at Salem State in June um, and I'm new to the region. And I told my colleagues where I worked in Western New York that um, I would be leaving to take a role at Salem State University. Um, most of those folks were New Englanders or New Yorkers. Um, and one said to me, I'm from Vermont. I'm really concerned about you taking a job at Winston-Salem University, in North Carolina. I'm like extremely concerned about you going to the South and doing diversity work in the South. This is He's, he's speaking about 2020, 2021 era. Um, and then when I shared with him, well, while Salem State University sounds like Winston-Salem, it's, it's actually in, in, in Massachusetts. And he demonstrated like incredible relief, right? That you, you, you won't be going to the South, you'll be going to a, a New England state and I'm from New England, I was born and raised in Vermont, so you know, it's a much better place to be. You don't have anything to worry about. Um, with regard to your work, your reactions were very, and your, your thoughts related to your work were, were really interesting. Do you mind sharing some of your thoughts around that way of no. thinking about the experience of black people in, in, in New England? I think, I think that it, it, another thing that, that never seems to, um, never seems to die, so, you know, you can't get a stake into its heart. Is this, I, this, this persistent idea that New England has always been a place of great, um, great uh, equity and equality and um, that, uh, because after all, it's the, sort, it's the site of um, emergence of, of white abolitionism. The first black abolitionist, of course, was the first black enslaved person who set foot here. That would be the first black abolitionist. But, but white abolitionism and garrison and, and the marvelous white people built a republic on white labor, which it absolutely for, uh, forgets, just effaces the history of, of, of not just the slave trade, but black labor building New England, that, that it's a white, white republic that marched south to shape up those evil southerners. And I think it, White, white people, a lot of white people in New England um, depend on that idea to let themselves off the hook for what every black person will tell you is the persistent racism here. But the racism here is cloaked in certain ways. And um, there's a great desire for, for black people to, to experience success and, you know, and, and rise, but so often not in my neighborhood. 
um, uh, the the idea, the number of 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 people I know who are followed around in stores. I mean that that's a common thing, but New Englanders want to think that sort of thing happens in the South, but it happens in Massachusetts and it happens in Rhode Island. Um, there, for all kinds of reasons, people of color here um, are living in a, um, a, a double world, which of course is what Du Bois talked about long ago um, as the United, about the United States as a whole, where the white people, a lot, most white people have one notion of what this place is like, and black people have a very different experience of it. Um, so, but, but your, your commentator there, oh, well, you're going to Massachusetts. Well, you know, that they're going to put out the red carpet for you. Well, then how come Henry Louis Gates gets arrested on his doorstep? And how come Cornell West is, is stopped driving, I think it was a Mercedes. And the assumption is to do that, he must be either a drug dealer or a pimp. I mean, that, I think that was something like the substance of my response. I could go on. I, this is this this amnesia about history here is tightly held, and peeling it away um, is an important thing to do. I think. Thank you so much. I have a question from the audience. The question is: Was it difficult to uncover the statistical information on the number of enslaved people in Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island? Did you encounter any surprises during your research process? Well, it's interesting um, uncovering statistics about about enslaved people. Um, some, for one thing, they are usually underrepresented in censuses, partly because they're taxable as property when they were enslaved. So um, we know that they're underreported. But they are, because they're taxed as property, they, they appear in some kinds of tax documents, but they appear in wills and probates. And you have to, um, people leave them as, as property. Um, so you, you um, and also uh, there, I mean, there, this question of management and control partly involves keeping track of people of color in New England. So, um, so there are lots and lots of sources from which you have to compile um, statistics about, about um, the, numbers, the numbers of these people, of numbers of, of people of color. What, did I encounter any surprises? Well, I was surprised that, that slavery, I was surprised that legal slavery didn't end in New, in, um, uh, New Hampshire until 1857. Uh, that seemed late. Um, I, I, I got over being surprised, I guess, fairly early in my research because I was just finding thing after thing, um, event after event. Um, there, sort of like I would tell my, I often said to my students who were all surprised, oh, but there's a law against X or Y. And I would say, how many of you have ever driven faster than 65 miles an hour? I mean, there's a law and then there's what people do. And so if you approached this topic from the point of view of what there were laws about, like this so-called supposed and, and court decisions and so forth, and you would be shocked to discover that, that, that white people in New England did not abide by any of those things. As I say, Vermont, you know, Vermont people, there may be some listening now who are already mad at me, um, will insist that we are the state that ended slavery and, you know, with our new constitution. Well, you ended legal slavery, but you were still enslaving people and buying and selling them until, until uh, 1810. So I, I was, a little surprised initially, and then I simply got used to finding something that was not part of the official story. And I, that still happens. I find things, and now I'm not surprised. I'm just, oh God, another one, I guess. This uh, next question, and please feel free to continue to, to ask questions. This next question is, is, is 
partially related to a question here. The question um, here was related to the availability of Charlotte's diary and her writings. Um, but are there other writings or writers that through your research you came across that you think are just really important to take a look at, read and learn if, if you're interested in the topic? Oh, oh, well, there are, yes. I mean, that, that, that's another thing, this idea that this stupid Henry Field said, you know, well, they're never, they're never educated people. I mean, there are all kinds of, of 19th century co contemporaries of Charlotte, but earlier than Charlotte. Um, who are who are writing? Um, uh, William Coopernell, uh, who uh, William Coopernell, the Nell family is one of the families that in Salem that that um, that Charlotte um, uh, is friends with. Um, he writes a wonderful thing, uh, "Colored Patriots of the American Revolution," because right from the beginning. People of color fight in wars, and then the next war, white people are reluctant to enlist them because, of course, they won't fight. And that happens. They fight in the revolution, reluctance in the War of 1812. They fight in the War of 1812, so, uh, and then, you know, all this reluctance. Well, I mean, reading William Coopernell, reading, um, um, I mean, there are novels, uh, of course, by people of color. Everybody should be reading, I think. Um, because something like Our Nig by Harriet Wilson is a story of a, a it's, it's her story, thinly disguised autobiography talking about what it was like to be a free uh, young woman of mixed color uh, in New Hampshire. Um, but there are uh, Henry Highland Garnett, his writing, uh, I, I don't even know where to, where to start because there are so many essayists and, and novelists of color um, to, to read. A, a book that is almost, um, almost never read these days, but it should be published, I think in 1859 is The Garys and Their Friends. Um, it's about Philadelphia, but um, it's written by Frank, um, I can't think of his last name right this minute, but he's a man of color writing about the mobbing attacks on black communities that kill the principal people in his, in his book. Um, it's about free people of color fighting off white mobs. Um, it's an amazing, amazing novel. I, I don't know where to, where to that's a, start. That's a phenomenal <laughs> start. And, and that's a phenomenal start. It gives, um, give us all a few additional. I mean, I, I, I'll send you know. I'll make up a list of 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 the hundred important things written by people of color in the in the eighteen hundreds that everybody should read. <laughs> if somebody would like it, I will do that. I would. I would love it. Um, I have about three more questions. If you have time for us, absolutely. Um, one of the questions asked. You had mentioned that Massachusetts. Massachusetts was the center of the slave trade? I said New England was the center and, and yes. Massachusetts was the center until 1700. And after, and of course, Salem, I mean, the first, the, as I'm sure you all know, the first African-Americans come in, um, a Salem boat takes Pequots, captive Pequots to the West Indies, trades them for Africans. And the first Africans who come into the United States come in in a, in a Salem boat, which is why it's among other things, calling Namkeg's other mill, the Pequot mills is, is in Salem. It's just so ironic that I can't stand it. But um, Massachusetts runs, sort of runs the, the American trade until uh, 1700, and after 1700, it's Rhode Island. Um, about half of all um, the, the slaving uh, voyages, there are about 2,000 slaving voyages that leave New England, and 1,000 of those come out of Rhode Island. Um, but Massachusetts is the center before, and it remains involved in the slave trade. It's just not um, the principal state after that. But of course, and remember, Massachusetts is the first state to legalize slavery um, in its in its um, 
unaptly named, inaptly named, um, uh, what is it called? The something or other of liberties, um, where, where it describes who can be enslaved. It's not Virginia, it's Massachusetts. The body of Thank liberties, you. the Massachusetts body of liberties. Thank you so much. The next question asks, what are the most effective ways white people in Salem and beyond can honor the legacy of Charlotte Fortin today? Well, I think, I think there are two, two ways maybe, um, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of ways, but two spring to mind. And, and one of them is, is by um, in the course of doing what you're doing, raising consciousness about her to um, make sure that, that curricula everywhere um, include the writings of, of Charlotte and other people of color, making clear, excuse me, the, the, the great body of contribution, of written contribution to American culture that um, that African Americans have made. There's such a, an emphasis when any when people talk about African American contributions, often they tend to oh there's the Harlem Renaissance, as though there weren't any black people writing anything till then, and then oh boy, and then it's over. But there, the 19th century has makes a contribution. So so making people aware that Charlotte, in a funny way, making people aware as Charlotte would say herself that she's not unique. She's emblematic of a, of a large number of people who are doing and saying and thinking what she is. So I, I guess that's number one. And number two is rooting out racism and, and rejecting root, racism and white supremacy. Looking at Charlotte says when people who, are, who reluctantly nod at her in the street, she doesn't return it. and and, and it, you know, she doesn't um, suck up to white supremacy. And I think um, every time you turn your back on and leave the room or call somebody out on a racist joke, every time you, um, you see some lady standing in front of the elevator waiting to get into the elevator and you, a black man, are in the elevator, the door in a three-piece suit even, and the door opens and suddenly that white lady doesn't wanna get on the elevator. She suddenly doesn't have to and moves away. Um, <laughs> walk out of the elevator and call her on it. I mean, in, in, in ways large and small, doing what, what Charlotte did in our time, I guess. That's uh, phenomenal. I appreciate it. And on the final question, I think I'll connect maybe your thoughts there with this question related to um, the thoughts about the role that current students at SSU um, can play um, in continuing the dialogue that goes back to the time when um, Charlotte was a young person here in, in, in Salem, Massachusetts. I think there's perhaps some connections between many of the things you've shared and presented today and the opportunity um, for our current students to contribute um, to the story moving forward. I think that, I think one can, can say that it is never um, out of date to be an abolitionist. I think, um, and telling, making, spreading the story of, um, I'm not trying to say that people should go around bad-mouthing New England, but I am saying that, that the, the signed, kind of sort of self-righteousness that continues to fuel ignorance about the racism going on all around us um, needs, that that um, that experience of of the racism all around us um, is it, I'm going in a circle here, but is fueled by partly by an absence of the history, 
the history is important. I, I'm a historian, not because um, I like old stuff, but because it, it really is the case that, that our world emerges out of hers. And so the students at, at Salem State, I think, can, can be part of, they, they must go out forth in the world and become teachers. They need to teach African-American history and the African-American history of New England and, and the racism that, that, that happen, has happened here and continues to go on here. They, um, they go forth and um, in all kinds of walks of life where it's possible to say, wait a minute, when someone says, well, those Southern blah, 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 but our, we're, wait a minute. That's not true. Um, I think speaking truth to power in these ways is, is what Salem State students can do. Professor Mellish, I very much appreciate being able to have this conversation with you today. I appreciate your presentation. And I guess under other circumstances, we'd hand you a gift bag right now and give you a big hug and say thank you for um, everything you've shared with us today. You sent me a gift bag and it actually, I, I wrote to Beth Bauer and said swag because it was great. I like the socks and there was a bag that says St Salem State that's really, really useful. Um, it's wonderful. So I, I have already been gifted and I thank you very much. Well, we thank you for being with us today and everything that you've contributed to, to this, this day in recognition of, of Charlotte Fortin. Um, I ask that everyone remain with us. We have one closing presentation and I am going to hand off to that presentation now. My country, oh, when wilt thou triumph over slavery, that terrible sin? Till freed from this curse, thou canst never hold blessings from heaven to win. Oh, when shall a child of our Father, whatever his nation or hue, be protected throughout thy dominions? Neath the folds of the red, white, and blue. Neath the folds of the red, white, and blue. Neath the folds of the red, white, and blue. Be protected throughout thy dominions. Neath the folds of the red, white, and blue. If thou, O Columbia, my country, were truly a home of the free, how gladly the hearts of thy children would offer thy homage to thee. Thy mandates would make tyrants tremble if liberty's form stood in view and summon brave men to assemble neath the folds of the red, white, and blue. Neath the folds of the red, white, and blue. Neath the folds of the red, white, and blue, and summon brave men to assemble. Neath the folds of the red, white, and blue, should war rage its white desolation and threaten the land to deform, we'd rally the men of the nation and laugh at the threatening storm. With freedom and hope and brave ardor, we battle the miscreant crew, and proudly aloft raise our banners, with cheers for the red, white, and blue, with cheers for the red, white, and blue, with cheers for the red, white, and blue, and proudly aloft raise our banners, with cheers for the red, white, and blue. The pure crystal nectar bring hither, and a bumper fill up to the brim, to a wreath that never will wither, and to glory that cannot grow dim. The wreath of the goddess of freedom, the glory to justice even due, 
Wendy shall adorn fair Columbia. We'll hurrah for the red, white, and blue. We'll hurrah for the red, white, and blue. We'll hurrah for the red, white, and blue. Wendy shall adorn fair Columbia. We'll hurrah for the red, white, and blue. We'll hurrah for the red, white, and blue. We'll hurrah for the red, white, and blue. Wendy shall adorn fair Columbia. We'll hurrah for the red, white, and blue. Thank you all for being part of today's presentation and discussion in recognition of Charlotte Fortin. This concludes our event for today and have a wonderful day.